Today on Newswatch, bloodbath in Dallas. Snipers murder police officers during a peaceful protest. Racial tensions escalating after police killed two black men earlier this week. Plus, FBI Director James Comey on the hot seat in the House. Why his testimony could lead to a new investigation of Hillary Clinton. And... Our apartment became a triage for spiritually broken people. People were desperate for answers. The darker side of paradise and how Christians are shining the light in an unexpected place. Thanks for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Caitlin Burke. The nation is grieving today and residents of Dallas are in shock after a devastating night of violence there. At least five police officers are dead and others critically injured after shooters disrupted a peaceful protest with a stunning assault. Gary Lane has that story. It began as a peaceful protest against the two recent fatal police shootings of black men. Then, just before 9 p.m., snipers opened fire on police. They're shooting! The gunfire came from two downtown Dallas parking garages. This is bad juju. Eleven police officers were shot. Five were killed. It is a heartbreaking morning. To say that our police officers put their life on the line every day is no hyperbole, ladies and gentlemen. It's a reality. Four suspects were apprehended and taken into custody. One said he wanted to kill more police officers. Dallas police shootings came in the aftermath of the police shootings of a black man in Minnesota and another in Louisiana. Both incidents were captured on cell phones and the Minnesota incident was live streamed on Facebook. We as a city, we as a country, must come together, lock arms, and heal the wounds that we all feel from time to time. Words matter. Leadership matters at this time. In Poland for a NATO summit, President Obama commented on the shootings saying the nation grieves with Dallas. I'd ask all Americans to say a prayer for these officers and their families. Keep them in, their, in your thoughts. And as a nation, let's remember to express our profound gratitude to our men and women in blue, not just today, but every day. Gary Lane, CBN News. An online college fund for Alton Sterling's five children has reached more than $500,000 in donations. Alton was shot by police during a confrontation earlier this week, sparking an uproar of controversy across the nation. Actress and writer Issa Rae started a GoFundMe campaign to show compassion for Sterling's family. The original goal was to raise $200,000, but donors more than doubled that goal in less than 24 hours. The U.S. Justice Department is currently investigating Sterling's death for evidence of foul play. The State Department is reopening its investigation of possible mishandling of classified information and emails by Hillary Clinton and some of her top assistants. The department had suspended, suspended its investigation in April to avoid interfering with the FBI's inquiry. The move came as congressional Republicans grilled FBI Director James Comey on Capitol Hill Thursday. They want to know why there was no recommendation to press charges against Clinton for using personal email servers for government business while she was Secretary of State. Abigail Robertson has that story from Washington. Case closed? Doesn't look like it. James Comey's nearly five-hour congressional hearing shows that questions about Hillary Clinton's email scandal are far from answered. And the controversy itself is far from over. I spent nine and a half years as an undercover officer in the CIA. I was the guy in the back alleys collecting intelligence, passing it to lawmakers. I've seen my friends killed. I've seen assets put themselves in harm's way. And this is about co protecting information, the most sensitive information the American government has. And I wish my colleagues would take this a little bit more seriously. Comey fought hard to defend the FBI's recommendation of no criminal charges, saying they could not find evidence Clinton intended to break the law. But lawmakers pointed out Clinton clearly didn't tell the truth about her actions with her email server on multiple occasions. Secretary Clinton said I did not email any classified material to anyone on my email. There is no classified material. Was that true? No, there was classified material emailed. Secretary Clinton said she used just one device. Was that true? She used multiple devices during the four years 
uh, of her term as Secretary of State. Now the question arises, did Clinton ever make these claims under oath? Whether it was a personal account or a government account, I did not send classified material and I did not receive any material that was marked or designated classified. Democrats argued she may not have seen the classified markings contained in some emails. Comey agreed, saying Secretary Clinton may not be sophisticated enough to understand the meanings of the markings on emails she sent and received. House Republicans said Thursday they will ask for a new FBI investigation into whether or not Clinton committed perjury, a felony that could be punished with prison time. But many doubt the Obama administration would ever try to convict her. It's not over yet for Mrs. Clinton. She's not out of the legal woods, at least criminally. But we shouldn't be naive as to uh, what this Justice Department is going to do because uh, President Obama has already said that Mrs. Clinton's done nothing. And I can't imagine they're going to want to look at whether she lied about doing nothing. Next Tuesday, Attorney General Loretta Lynch will also testify before the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee, where she will be questioned about the email investigation and likely her controversial meeting with Bill Clinton as well. Reporting from Washington, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. President Obama is calling on European leaders to stand firm against terrorism, Russia, and other challenges now that Britain has left the EU. The president published his remarks in an op-ed for the Financial Times, writing, I believe that our nations must summon the political will and make concrete commitments to meet these urgent challenges. I believe we can, but only if we stand united as true allies and partners. His statement comes as he meets with EU leaders in Poland to weigh the impact and consequences of Brexit. With students on summer break, states are fighting to stop the Obama administration's transgender bathroom directive. Thirteen states have sued the administration over the policy that requires public schools to allow transgender students to use the bathroom of their choice. Reuters reports the coalition is now asking the federal courts to keep the administration from enforcing the policy while the lawsuit proceeds. A Justice Department official told the state's lawyers the department opposes their motion. Multiple local and county schools are dropping the tradition of prayer. That comes after anti-religion groups told the schools it's unconstitutional. One school board council in South Carolina is opening their meetings now with a moment in, of silence instead of praying. American United for Separation of Church and State said the tradition exploits the prayer opportunity to advance the Christian faith. Meanwhile, a school superintendent in Arkansas has dropped prayer from all future graduation ceremonies. The no prayer trend is also taking place in the areas of Florida and North Carolina. After 200 years, the site many believe to be Jesus' empty tomb is getting critical renovations. A rare agreement between major religious leaders who take care of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre made it possible. CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell has that story. Deep in the heart of Jerusalem's Christian quarter lies the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It's the place where many believe Jesus was crucified, buried and rose from the dead. Hundreds of thousands of pilgrims visit the church each year. The Roman Emperor Constantine built the church more than 1600 years ago. Over the centuries, it's been burnt, suffered from earthquakes, destroyed by Muslims, and reconstructed many times. The last repair work happened in 1810, when the Edicule or Mausoleum was rebuilt following a fire. After the earthquake of 1927, there was a kind of damage around the edical and even in the edical itself. Nothing happened then because as tour guide Saeed Rabie told us, the Greek Orthodox, Roman Catholic and Armenian Orthodox churches responsible for the site's management couldn't agree on repairs. There is always a kind of a competition between the different denominations. Who will have the honor to pray more in such a place or to have a bigger part or to be the honor of serving the holy place. Now that leaders have put that competition aside, Professor Antonia Marapulo will lead the restoration project. We will uh, remove the marble slabs, the stone slabs. Uh, we will inject grouts to homogenize the complex structure, which is the holy rock. That means that uh, we develop a unified structure, that all the layers will behave structurally as one. And upon this, 
after um, repairing uh, with new compatible and performing mortars and concrete, we will readjust the stone slabs with titanium bolts. And the restoration takes in the tiniest details. We start with one method and then we maybe we continue with another method so that to have a very clean surface. As you can see here, you can tell the difference between the two surfaces. The three denominations and Jordan's King Abdullah will put up more than $3 million for the work, which should be complete by March 2017. Major repairs will happen at night so visitors aren't disturbed. For those working on the project, it's more than just a job. Of course, I'm very exciting. Yeah. Because I'm a Christian Orthodox and I am working in Greece in uh, monuments like this. But uh, this is a specialized project, very specialized project. I don't believe that I can go to something bigger than this. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem's Old City. Coming up, just miles away from picture-perfect beaches comes a scene you won't see in postcards. See how God is using missionaries to bring true beauty from brokenness. If you want to get away from it all, how about a relaxing vacation in a tropical paradise? The U.S. Virgin Islands would appear to fit the bill with plush beaches, warm weather, and ocean breezes. But looks can be deceiving. David Brody takes us to the island of St. John for this exclusive look at how one church is ministering on the other side of paradise. Ads and brochures selling dream vacations want you to see paradise about a thousand miles south of Florida. On the surface, the U.S. Virgin Islands appear postcard perfect, but dive a little deeper and you'll find a much different picture. Video of broken down public schools doesn't help fill hotels or pack beaches. The fact is, life for locals is far from paradise. More than 30% of families with young children live below the poverty line. Overall in this territory of 100,000 people or so, the poverty rate is 23% compared to 15% on the mainland. But there is hope. The beaches here on the island of St. John are simply breathtaking. But just steps away from Hawk's Nest Beach, something else breathtaking is happening. Freshwater Church is talking about Jesus, living out the gospel, and sharing an eternal message here with the locals that they so desperately need. Each Sunday, you will find them here, right next to the beach, praising Jesus. Pastor Terry Lansdale and his wife, Marta, are missionaries in St. John. God called them during their very first visit to the island. God immediately spoke in a quiet voice and just simply said, Terry, this is a place for you. What they found was far from paradise. Our apartment became a triage for spiritually broken people. People were desperate for answers. Including one man fighting an addiction that Pastor Terry will never forget. This man uh, knocked on the door and uh, said, Terry, if you don't have something positive that you can share with me, this is my last moment. But God intervened, and uh, so I lived life with him for the next week. Father, I thank you for each one that you've drawn here this morning. I mean, unfortunately, uh, brokenness, it doesn't matter if you're in paradise. Amber Pinegas was living in New York City three years ago, but God kept leading her to St. John. There's a lot of people down here who don't really know how to deal with their brokenness. Uh, there is a lot of alcohol. There's a lot of drugs on the island. We've seen lives saved. We've seen people that are hurt just reach out to us and they not know us that well at all, but because God was in it and we were definitely prayed up and definitely going, moving forward, uh, we're blessed by being obedient. That obedience includes sharing the good news with poor children attending public school. We can go down during their lunch recess and they allow us to play, play with the children. They so also allow us to share the gospel. They allow, allow us to share Jesus stories with those little children. And that's why Freshwater Church makes ministering to people and fostering community a top priority. Get your arms around people and love people. Let them understand the value they have in God and you will be shocked 
how people will begin to respond and come out. It's been working. When the church started three years ago, they had sparse attendance. Now, dozens and dozens keep flowing in. This church made a difference in my life. It turned my life around. Katie Connell has been on the island of St. John 23 years now. And I told God, if you let me live there, I'll dig ditches, I'll clean toilets. I don't care what I have to do. And sure enough, I got here and um, I did clean toilets. <laughs> Toilet cleaning turned into running four companies. Eventually, life got too busy and Katie started focusing on herself. Then she learned a valuable lesson. Religion is kind of kept in the dark here. Uh, they might go to church on Sunday, but they don't talk about it during the week. Mm. And this was a church that was teaching me, not only do you talk about it during the week, you talk about it with your employees, you run your company that way, you do everything according to God's will. For Pastor Terry and Marta, that's what it's all about, doing God's will even if it means being far away from their grown-up kids. I like hugging them and I miss it, uh, but at the same time, God is just blessed us so much and will leave a legacy for our children to carry on that is, it's all good. It sure is, especially when you have Jesus and are spreading his word to the underprivileged. The church is indeed providing much needed fresh water. Everybody needs a drink of fresh water and uh, we thought that that was what we were bringing to people was the word of Jesus and and uh, Jesus said in himself, if you just give someone a cup of water in my name. David Brody, CBN News, on the island of St. John. Up next, movies for your whole family, from the secret life of pets to finding Dory, plus a powerful movie for adults that you might want to check out. There's some pretty good options for families at the movies this weekend. CBN's Mark Martin spoke with Bob Walaszewski from Plugged In Online to help you find the right picks for your family. Take a look. Let's start with The Secret Life of Pets. It looks like it's geared for kids and adults. What did you think? I liked it. I thought it was cute. I definitely think families have something this weekend to consider if they want to take the kids or take the family to a movie. It essentially looks at someone's creative ideas of what pets do when their owners head to work or go off to Starbucks or do whatever they do. And uh, it's clever. Do they just sit at the door all day waiting for their owners to return? Do they just uh, raid the refrigerator? Do they just bark at squirrels all day? Well, those are a few of the things that the uh, creators came up with, and it, they really are some chuckles. But more than anything, it focuses on Max in New York City apartment building and his pet pals, uh, when one day his owner, Katie, brings home a rescue dog named Duke. Max does, Max does not want to share that apartment with a another dog, um, and pretty soon they're tumbling, uh, lands them out on the street where there's some dog catchers and a gang of mean animals led by a not so cute bunny. Um, family friendly, yes. Um, I do want to point out that like many animated films these days, there is some uh, toilet humors to deal, toilet humor to deal with. And one thing I'll just say that the dogs lie about something that they say they did to their owner, um, which isn't true, but if it were true, it would be a bit gruesome. We'll put it that way. Can families navigate that? I believe so, but I want to make sure families know about it too. All right. Well, what other family-friendly movies are in theaters right now? You know, it's a pretty good time, actually, if you, if you were looking to go to some movies. Uh, the number one film in the nation, and has been for three weeks, is Finding Dory, Pixar's newest one. It's been out three weeks, made almost $400 million in the U.S., and we gave it a perfect score of five out of five. So if you're watching this today and you're looking for something and you're thinking, should I go Secret Life of Pets or Finding Dory? I'd say Finding Dory's better, uh, but I do like Secret Life of Pets, as I said. Also, Steven Spielberg's BFG came out last week. Didn't do very well at the box office, but it's family friendly. It's very creative, imaginative, and special effects are phenomenal. We gave it a four. And maybe for a date night movie, 
um, The Free State of Jones. Now, I rarely talk about a film that gets that's as violent as this one, but this is kind of a uh, Saving Private Ryan or a Braveheart, that type of movie where it's really good at its core. And yet I do want to warn there is the first 10 to 15 minutes, it is pretty brutal, pretty gruesome in this Confederate battle scene that we're, we, we actually watch a whole lot of things that are going on. So not a, fam, not a film for everybody, uh, but for f- people that liked Braveheart and that sort of thing, they may want to read our longer review. All right. Bob Walaszewski with Plugged In Online. Thanks for your time today, Bob. Thanks for your insights. You, you bet your mark. In Thailand, CBN's Orphans Promise is giving weekly training for kids dealing with drug abuse. They're doing that by partnering with a local church and CBN's Thailand's humanitarian wing. Every Saturday, about 30 kids are taught about the danger from drugs, along with lessons on Christian values. The program also gives parental training and home visits for other family members dealing with drug abuse. Orphans Promise has seen an overall decrease in drug abuse, as well as an improvement in education from the program. You can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by logging on to cbn.com slash international. That's it for now on CBN Newswatch. You can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care about most at cbnnews.com. And tell us what you think about the stories you've seen here. You can do that on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We hope you'll join us next time. Have a great day.